Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to The Winter Show. Thank you for joining us today for our panel, Contemporary Art and Cold War Embassies, presented in collaboration with the Fund for Park Avenue. Today's speakers will examine the impact of modernist design, art, and architecture in nurturing cultural connections amid the Cold War era. Furthermore, they will address the importance of conserving the historical and architectural legacy of these embassies and explore how innovative approaches in contemporary art can make these stories tangible for future generations. I'm delighted to welcome our esteemed panelists, Jennifer Duncan, Director of the Foundation for Art and Preservation in Embassies, Jorge Otero Pilos, artist, preservationist, and Director of the Historic Preservation Program at Columbia University, David Peterson, author of U.S. Embassies of the Cold War and founder of the Onera Foundation, and our moderator, Julia P. Hertzberg. Dr. Hertzberg is a historian, independent curator, and a member of the Fund for Park Avenue Sculpture Advisory Committee. Julia, over to you. Thank you very much, Helen, for having invited us to participate in the Winter Show. Begin with, with David Peterson who is the executive director of the Onera Foundation, a private foundation dedicated to supporting historic preservation and significant architecture. Mr. Peterson is board chair of Harlem Academy, an independent and New York City school offering promising students a leading education regardless of economic circumstances. He serves on the Advisory Council of the Glass House, a National Trust Historic Site in New Canaan, Connecticut. He holds a BA from Dartmouth College, an MBA from New York University, and an MS in Historic Preservation from Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. His first book, entitled U.S. Embassies of the Cold War, The Architecture of Democracy, Diplomacy, and Defense, was released in 2003. Take it away. So I'm going to talk briefly, very briefly, because it's really Jorge's night tonight, uh, briefly about the Cold War, about some of the embassies in my book, uh, a little bit about the programming within the embassies, and then I'll talk a little bit about where the embassies are today. So... As most of you know, or some of you know about the Cold War, uh, one of the things we don't know is when it started. There were no bullets fired, there were no bombs dropped, uh, but not long after the end of World War II, the U.S.'s single most important focus on foreign affairs was the containment of communism. And the threat of communism was very deep and very strong. So the question is, how do you, how do you contain communism? Well, you build up your military, or your weapons. In 1950, we had a couple hundred nuclear weapons. Uh, by 1960, we had, had over 10,000 nuclear warheads. Uh, the other thing is you gather information. So we, we founded the uh, CIA uh, in 1947. Uh, we, that helped to gather information. And then the third thing we did was try to convince heart, hearts and minds about the benefits of democracy over communism. And how do you do that? Well, we started the U.S. Information Agency, which uh, goal was to teach the world about America. And what does that really mean? Well, uh, started Voice of America. At one time, that had 30 million listeners. Uh, the U.S. Information Service uh, publications, uh, we were the largest publisher in the world at one time, over 50 magazines in 40 countries, over 25 newspapers in 30 countries. Uh, and then the third part was something called cultural diplomacy. And what does that mean? That's soft power cultural diplomacy. Uh, what did we do? Well, if you want to convince hearts and minds, you've got to do newspapers and magazines and publish and broadcast. But one of the things we did was to build embassies around the world. We built over 25 embassies between 1948 and 1962 around the world, considered mid-century modern, for the most part, embassies the Cold War embassies. These were by designed by some of the greatest architects in the world, as I'll let you know in a minute. Uh, and they were 
built to portray America as a modern progressive nation as opposed to the uh, tyranny of communism. So you'll see in a minute. Here are a couple of the embassies we're gonna go through quickly. Here's Havana, Harrison and Blomroitz, uh, early 19th. This is one of the very first embassies. Uh, Wallace Harrison was the on the design team for the UN. If you, some of the architects in the audience, a very similar architectural style, language for that building. A lot of controversy in that building. It wasn't open for very long until uh, Batista was overthrown by Castro, and it was managed for decades by the Swiss government. Obama opened it uh, under his administration, Trump closed it, and Biden has opened it again. So it's in the last year or so, it's been taking uh, visas. Uh, coincidentally enough, uh, Harrison and Brown was, uh, were the architects for the embassy, for the embassy, excuse me, for the CIA headquarters in Langley, Langley, Virginia. Uh, Dublin, John Johansson, uh, he actually married Walter Groby's his daughter. Uh, this is a Celtic designed, influenced embassy uh, that was built on a triangular plot. And Johansson built a circular building because he believed that America should never turn its back on anyone. New Delhi, probably the most famous of the Cold War embassies. Edward Royal Stone, uh, what can you say about it? Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright called it the greatest government, U.S. government building ever built. Athens, Walter Gropius, uh, built with the same pentelic marble as the Parthenon. Uh, Walter Gropius designed the uh, MetLife building, not or the Pan Am building, now the MetLife building, and a few buildings in, uh, in Boston. Founder of the Bauhaus, 1919 to 1933. Uh, Nazis shut it down. He went to uh, Harvard, where he was head of the School of Architecture for a while. Aero Saren in London, uh, another very famous building at Grosvenor Square. Unfortunately, uh, it's in the process of being turned into a hotel uh, and uh, restaurants. Aero Saren, very famous for uh, the St. Louis Arch, Engels Ring in, at Yale, uh, and quite a few other buildings. Uh, the Hague, Marcel Breuer's building. Uh, again, it's a landmark. Marcel Breuer did the, uh, not, this, not the Whitney, Whitney Museum, Museum. Uh, Accra, Harry Weiss. Harry Weiss is famous for the metro station in Washington, D.C. Uh, this is based on a Wai'anae palace. Uh, this is more the contextual uh, architecture using materials and they're from uh, mahogany and so forth and, and gone. He built it up high like that for the insects and the circulation. Caracas, uh, no longer a U.S. Embassy in Venezuela. Harry Bertoya built the uh, art, uh, art panels on the exterior. Uh, you may know Bertoya's work from the uh, former bank on Fifth Avenue. Uh, Bertoya's uh, metal panels are in that building still. I think it's a retail store at the moment. Uh, Oslo, uh, Jorge's going to talk a lot more about Oslo, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Oslo. Again, uh, Aero Sharon building, you can see from this angle there are two entrances. Uh, this is where I want to talk a little bit about the, the programming of these buildings, because many people don't know that if you look at the bottom right, that's the consular uh, entrance. In the middle is the uh, uh, workers and, and diplom diplomats entrance. And then on the left is the U.S. Information Services. And what did the U.S. Information Services provide? Well, they had a library. They had an auditorium. Uh, at the peak, the London... Uh, library had over 100,000 visitors annually. Uh, but the arts were part of the, and that's one of the reasons we're here tonight, the arts were part of the battle of communism uh, versus democracy. And uh, President Eisenhower, it was 1954, I think, uh, felt it important enough to go to the 25th anniversary of the Museum of Modern Art to talk about the benefits of a free and open society. Uh, in fact, one of the largest and most important art exhibitions of that era was at the U.S. Embassy in London. Some of the greatest architecture you can imagine, uh, Rothko, Motherwell, uh, many others, just a blockbuster exhibition within the embassy. This was kind of a typical, not very fancy, but it was useful. And this is what uh, Khrushchev, who was the premier of 
the Soviet Union in the time said about art. Uh, by the way, that's de Kooning's painting that sold a few years ago for $250 million. I guess he wasn't that crazy. Uh, where are they today? Well, uh, unfortunately, a good number are no longer around. They've been sold or decommissioned. Uh, a few have been abandoned. Uh, roughly 25% remain uh, as embassies. A few are in the process of being decommissioned, uh, Dublin and Mexico City. Uh, the good news is about seven are, are landmarked of some sort. Uh, that doesn't mean that they can't be repurposed. Unfortunately, uh, Saarinen's embassy in London uh, it was a grade two uh, rating, and it was gutted completely. And unfortunately, it's a sad thing to look at. But uh, New Delhi, Athens, and some of the Oslo was sold recently. Uh, but that's being kept the way it is, including some of the interiors. Again, uh, Corey will talk about that. Uh, and finally, the, the part that's exciting is that after years of building prison-like bunker embassies, after some of the uh, terrorist attacks, uh, well, 83 was the one in Beirut, and then in 1998, there were simultaneous attacks in Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, the U.S. started to build with the really bunker embassies, very safe, very uh, remote, but prison-like embassies. And now the, the U.S. is moving back towards a much more uh, architectural-focused uh, building that is both hopefully secure and good to look at. So let me uh, in introduce to Jennifer Duncan. So what is FAPE? Foundation for Art and Preservation and Embassies, the public-private partnership with the State Department dedicated to providing permanent works of American art for our U.S. embassies around the world. I'm honored that my board member, City Lansing, is here, as well as several artists and supporters of our program. Thanks to them, and since our founding in 1986, we have raised more than $185 million in art and monetary contributions for the State Department. Today, I'm going to focus on what the art and preservation means in FAPE and how Ellsworth Kelly brought the two together. Um, preservation projects were a primary focus for FAPE when we were founded. Our board was committed to assisting and supporting the State Department in preserving the historic U.S. embassies, as well as the art, antiques, and high-value furnishings, furnishings located in these facilities. But today I'd like to talk about one specific project in honor of Jorge and his birthplace at the U.S. Embassy in Madrid, Spain. In 1958, the State Department acquired these two magnificent murals by Josep Maria Sert for, the embassy, for display in the embassy's lobby. FAPE funded the restoration of these murals by conservator Santiago Ferrete Ponce in 1984. Nearly 30 years later, Mr. Ponce once again oversaw the conservation of the murals when the State Department moved them from Madrid to our U.S. consulate in Barcelona. This was particularly meaningful since Serret was born in Barcelona and he had collaborated with the building's architect, Sagnier. So I've got a short clip um, of this film that the embassy produced showing the move to Madrid to Barcelona, but don't hold me responsible for the music. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I'm going to ruin your life. Um, now I'd like to talk about the A, art in FAPE. In 1989, when preservation projects were, be, were in progress or, were being or had been completed, FAPE started building a museum-quality collection of contemporary modern art for the State Department. To achieve this, we established the original print collection, our oldest program. Thanks to Wendy Lors, our founder, who I don't think is here but was coming, and her husband, Bill, Frank Stella, inaugurated the collection by donating to the symphony, an edition large enough for every U.S. embassy. Frank's piece is on the upper left-hand corner of this slide, and then next to it is Sarah Z's The Then and Now, which she just presented to Secretary of State Blinken 
at our State Department dinner last October. This program was so successful that in 2013, we established a similar collection of photography. And this slide reflects the works that were given to us in October, Statue of Liberty and Tulips by Joel Gray, and then this wonderful um, untitled photograph by Gwen Norton of Death Valley. The works in these collections are available to ambassadors and embassy personnel to curate their own collections. FAPE covers all costs for creating, framing, shipping, etc. The works remain permanently and are part of the State Department's inventory managed by the Office of Cultural Heritage. We also work with Cultural Heritage if an embassy is being decommissioned. Together we ensure that the artists either move to the new facility or to another location. This happened several years ago in Oslo, Norway, when we moved out of the Saarinen building to a new facility. And Jorge, I know, will be speaking more about Oslo during his remarks. In 1998, the success of our original print and photography collections led to the expansion of our public-private partnership with the State Department. We were asked to commission a work of art for the first new U.S. Embassy being built in over 20 years in, in Ottawa, Canada. We commissioned Joel Shapiro, who created this magnificent 40-foot high sculpture entitled Conjunction. I believe it is still the largest sculpture that Joel has made. The work is highly visible and has become a landmark in Ottawa because of its location near the embassy, the historic York's, York Steps, and Parliament. There are now 20 works in the site-specific collection, and five are in progress. So these are some of the pieces that are done. Um, in the top or right-hand corner is a piece by Odili Donald Adita, which is actually down the street at the U.S. Mission to the United Nations. Below that is a piece by Ellen Zimmerman at our U.S. Embassy in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Next to it is Martin Perrier's piece in, at our U.S. Embassy in Beijing, China. And then the ones on the far right are two pieces that are um, currently in progress. The top is by Avis Robinson. It's a series of watercolors of what will eventually become quilts, and they will be placed in every elevator bank at our new U.S. Embassy in Hanoi, Vietnam. And then what I'm most excited about um, is Roy Lichtenstein's Green Street Mural, um, which the foundation and the state have given to FAPE, which will be installed hopefully in March. Um, in the diplomatic entrance at the new U.S. Embassy in Mexico City. Since we're talking about Cold War embassies, I'd like, to I'd like to talk about Athens, Greece. In the early 2000s, the State Department hired KMW Architecture to build a new annex, and we were asked to commission a work of art for the lawn of the new building. We worked with Michael Singer, who created this wonderful courtyard garden and sculpture. Michael's piece captures the essence of fape and our site-specific collection, that art and architecture can engage global citizens to foster mutual understanding and build long-term relationships. When the State Department decided to convert the Gropius building to a cultural center, thank heavens it wasn't sold like other Cold War embassies, and build a new embassy, FAPE was pleased to donate another major site-specific work. Last September, we installed 275 Greek travel collages by Greek-American artist Stephen Antonakis. These works greet, greet dignitaries and guests in the ambassador suite. The collages feature the artist's findings from travel throughout Greece, a postage stamp, a menu from a restaurant. He would then take his findings back to his studio and create the collages. The installation is a wonderful conversation piece, connecting the United States and Greece. In fact, our current ambassador uses it as a backdrop for photograph and official presentations. I am honored that his wife, Naomi, is here with us today. In fact, she just was in Greece a couple of weeks ago. And Naomi, we can't thank you enough for your extraordinary gift to our program. It's just absolutely magnificent. And on behalf of FAPE, the embassy in Athens, as well as the people in this historic city, thank you. In total, FAPE's collection now includes work by more than 250 American artists. And we have placed art in more than 140 countries across Europe, Asia, Latin America, and Africa. All artworks commissioned or placed by FAPE are either gifts from an artist or donor. And Ellsworth Kelly, I think, said it best when he was asked as to why he and his fellow artists participate in FAPE. And he said, it's good for our embassies to have great American art. We're all patriotic, and that's why we do. In 2016, things came full circle for FAPE regarding art and preservation when the Ellsworth Kelly Foundation 
made a landmark gift to our program to establish the Ellsworth Kelly Fund for Conservation. Jack Shear, a board member of FAPE and director of the Kelly Foundation said, Ellsworth strongly supported FAPE's mission. We were happy to establish an endowment for the care of its collection at no cost to the government and also in perpetuity. It is important that these great works of American art to be preserved for future generations and ensure a sense of place around the world. A most recent project, thanks to the Kelly Fund, was uh, Joel Shapiro's now at the U.S. Consulate in Guangzhou, China, and you can see that the pollution really had uh, done a, <laughs> done some damage to the original paint. But um, during the pandemic, we were able to have it done, which was a feat in itself. And then I'm proud that on January 27th, 2022, uh, we returned Joel's piece back to its original splendor. So thank you so much. Thank you, Julia. Um, and, and thank you all for being here tonight. It's so wonderful to see so many familiar faces, colleagues from Columbia, uh, friends in this project. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, Laurence Laforgue, my partner in this project. So when I speak here, um, uh, I don't know where she's sitting, but oh, there she is. Uh, we're, nothing would happen without her. It's an honor to to be here with David and Jen, who've done so much uh, to advance the preservation of embassies around the world. And so I'll tell you a little bit about this this project. I'm very um, honored to to be invited to show these works on Park Avenue. And none of this would have happened uh, also without a form of intercultural exchange between the Park Avenue Fund, and the Queen Sofia Spanish Institute led by Begonia Santos over here. So thank you so much. As a Spanish-American uh, hyphenated, it's very important to me that the source of this exchange. Um, let me tell you a little bit about my process. Here's the sculptures that are going to be shown are going to be right in front of this building, right in front of the Park Avenue Armory but also in relationship to certain organizations on Park Avenue that deal with intercultural exchange, Council, Foreign Relations, the America Societies, and so many others. In fact, Park Avenue is a bit of a laboratory for intercultural exchange and diplomacy, and we can talk about that in the Q&A period, certainly for the kind of intercultural exchange that happened through corporations that mid-century started to build their their corporate headquarters here. And two of those buildings are very important. The Seagram Building, which was the first one to set back from the street and create a plaza for people to be able to walk on. And one of the sculptures will be in front of that. And across from Lever House, of course, was a Dutch company. So Canadian company, Dutch company, so many companies from around the world built their corporate embassies, let's call them. Um, this work started... Well, it really started when I walked into the U.S. Embassy in Madrid and went to that library and decided to immigrate. Um, but it really started in about a decade ago when with my students, colleagues, some of whom are here tonight, Mark Brakatansky, O faculty at Columbia, we started taking an interest in the decommissioning of these embassies around the world and working with students to think about what would happen next. If the embassies are sold, U.S. no longer controls them. How can we guarantee, how can we work to make sure that their stories are told and preserved? Now, of course, it's a debate that goes back to the 1960s. You can see Ada Louise Huxtable in 1960s saying, what should an embassy be? And 2013, we were asking, what should a former U.S. embassy? And so we traveled with our students to... Uh, Oslo, and here we are in the center courtyard of the Oslo Embassy uh, with the students and did a number of projects with them to imagine the future of those embassies. Now, here on the left, the embassy as it was built in 1959, that's one of the entrances, the consular entrance that you can see under that white canopy on the left, and here is it, it is on the right with a fence that went up around it in 2002. Now, it was preserved. The embassy was considered a national monument, and it was landmarked the minute that the United States sold it. 
And we wanted as a philosophy to try to preserve as much of the material as possible. And one of the most difficult objects to preserve was this fence that went around the building. Because, of course, it was in a very important part of the history. It was a first act of preservation, trying to keep the place um, safe and from damage. But it was also standing in the way of people being able to access the embassy. So it was two things at once. And we wanted to preserve it, and we wanted to find a way to preserve it. But, of course, it was coming down because the landmarking authorities decided it was not historically significant. It was not important. They decided to send it to the garbage. So um, part of my work was to try to think about how can we preserve it. And this is where my practice as experimental preservation combines advanced technologies, materials research, conservation, collaborations uh, with other disciplines, architects, planners, real estate developers. In fact, this was purchased by one of um, leading real estate developers. Norway, uh, to really think about how can we preserve this history. So here's a timeline. In 2017 was a key moment of, that's when the embassy was designated. And um, then in 2019, we proceeded with the demolition. What I did was to take the demolition process and in a way turn it into its, itself and turn the demolition process into a creative act, into an act of making sculpture. And so I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second, but of course now we are in 2024 and the sculptures are coming to New York. And the um, sculptures that are coming are these three sculptures, analog sites, biosignature preservation, and byproduct material. I'll tell you more about their names and where they come from in a second. Here's a drawing of the embassy. It was drawn uh, here in New York. You can see the embassy in the back, and in the front is drawn the fence. This was the drawing that designed the fence. It was part of, as you can see on the upper right-hand side, a perimeter upgrade to the Oslo embassy. Now, the fence, which you can see highlighted here in the drawing, is a first act of preservation. And it is a way of protecting the embassy. I'll have the next. Now, what about this fence? What is so important about it? Um, it was designed by Davis Brody Bond. Uh, they're here in New York. So it's a New York fence. It was designed in New York. Here's the firm of Davis Brody Bond. Max Bond actually was the chair of the Department of Architecture at Columbia University between 68 and the mid-1980s. So there is a connection to our school there. Next. Uh, but of course, behind that fence was a whole group of people. Eero Saarinen, the most important uh, designer, of course, but also Florence Knoll, who designed all of the furniture inside the embassy. In fact, started her company in Europe thanks to these commissions to put furniture in all the U.S. embassies. And of course, uh, Harry Bertoya, who was uh, to design a sculpture in the middle of the, of the embassy. We'll have the next. And so, of course, um, if we go through this embassy in the left-hand side, and we're going to zoom in now to that part, that is the main entrance. That's the ambassadorial entrance. And behind that entrance was supposed to be this sculpture. And I was very interested in the work of Bertoya. Bertoya worked with metal. There's a Bertoya sculpture in the show, by the way, that I recommend everybody go see. Um, and he worked with Saarinen in many, many projects. Now, uh, of course, it was Calder at this time who was also working on public sculpture, also very influential for me. So I was thinking about metal sculpture. Of the next. Of course, the uh, sculpture was in the middle of this atrium, which was in dialogue with the architecture. And if you look to the left, that's a balcony that Saarinen designed. And Saarinen, instead of putting a handrail around the balcony, he decided to put vertical slats going all the way three stories up and down to protect the offices so that people couldn't climb up the wall and get into the embassy. So in fact, Saarinen had des designed a wooden fence to protect the embassy, but the wooden fence was inside the embassy. And for me, this was very, very interesting because I was thinking about the fact that 
Bertoya with those vertical elements was already channeling and reimagining the fence that Saarinen had designed of the next. And so the uh, artwork was actually never made. And in fact, um, the atrium remained empty. So part of what I was thinking about is now we have this fence outside. There was an original kind of fencing inside the building. How do we relate these two? Now, part of it is when you think about it, an embassy is really the people that are inside the building. The building itself is called a chancery. And a chancery, uh, the word comes from the Latin word cancellus, which is a, 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 the, the word for gates, uh, for fences. The chancellor is the gatekeeper that controls the messages that go back and forth through that fence. The chancellor is, of course, the ambassador. So for me, the idea of fence was not just superfluous to the embassy, it's really integral to an embassy. An embassy is a gatekeeping device. It's a way of staying closed and open at the same time. That's the nature of diplomacy. I'll have the next. And so when thinking about how to demolish the fence, I, I, I use the machinery to try to begin to alter and transform this fence. Now, fences live in a world of straight lines. Uh, of divisions, borders. And I wanted to make uh, a transformation of these straight lines to involute them, to twist them, to turn them inside out and to go from a line to a volume to something you could walk around, to something that enacted this idea of exchange, of back and forth, of circling, and of imagining that, that, uh, that process visually. So I took all the pieces of the transformation of the fence that we did with this tractor and uh, the turning and twisting. We didn't use heat. We didn't heat up the fence. We just used the power of the machinery to turn it and twist it. And then took the pieces in a warehouse outside of uh, Norway in Oslo and, uh, and welded them back together into these monumental uh, sculptures. And so part of what I was trying to do here is to preserve not just the fence, but also that the fence would preserve the act of taking it down, that it would be uh, embodying the very process of its making. So next. And so here you have some of those uh, sculptures next. And uh, part of what interested me was that architecture, you know, an architect never builds, an architect draws, and a diplomat discusses and writes. So part of what an embassy, this embassy was all about is, is documents, the production of drawings, the production of texts, and how these texts are related to one another. So I was very interested in also taking drawings such as this, drawn by Davis Brody Bond, but also the writing of the ambassadors, the writing of the diplomats, which is also a world of straight lines. You know, all these treaties that ambassadors write have these straight lines. The text is in, is in straight lines. So I'll have the next. And to think about how I could bring the world of volume and, and mobility and exchange into that world of the next. And so I began to play with the treaties that were signed between the United States and Norway um, and to bring the text and turn it into the sculptures. I'll have the next. And so here you have treaties. This is a treaty on space cooperation. I chose to show you this treaty because it's sitting on the other side of this door. There's a little pop-up exhibition there where you can see it. I'll have the next. And to take the text and literally begin to twist the text of the treaties and turn it into the sculptures. And so the sculptures literally pick up words from the text and that those words are the titles of the sculptures. So, for example, biosignature preservation, which is on the lower right-hand side, which will be shown outside of the Park Avenue Armory, is part of the treaty dealing with finding life on Mars. And for me, this was very interesting because we talk about diplomacy only as if diplomacy only has to do with war. Diplomacy has to do with getting people to talk to one another, with exchange, with collaboration, with research, with imagining the future as well and making that possible. So as somebody that does research, I'm very interested in the kind of research that is made possible this way. So we'll have the next. And so the, um, the treaties then, as they uh, as, as, you know, transformed into sculptures, become a set of prints. There are 51 prints. You can see some of them outside. They can be framed. This is uh, treaty number 10. 
which has some of those sculptures in it. And all of those prints, if you have the next, um, come together and uh, the 51 of them uh, can be taken out and they go inside of a book and we'll have the next, um, next, next. And the book itself contains the plan of the United States Embassy in Norway, which is a triangular building. And the, and the prints uh, next are folded inside the book and then can come out and become paper sculptures, which can be put around the triangular plan and become, again, the fence of the building, but now with all of those stories enacted within them. We'll have the next. And then, of course, the images of all the sculptures are around the book. And then the, tr the title of the artist book is Treaties on Defenses. The idea that you have to both defend, that's an act of preservation, to defend something, to stand up for something, to stand up for U.S. embassies, but also not to be defensive and to also take out the fences, to remove the fences, to be open and to protect at the same time. And so the whole project is both contained within the book, but also expansive outside and in Park Avenue. So thank you. Well, Corey, I'm going to begin with you. Um, you have shown us a great deal of your creative process, but maybe you could just focus for a moment or so on the activity of drawing because it was so extensive um, that followed the defensing or the destruction of the perimeter fence, the U.S. Embassy in Oslo, um, which was totally mangled before it became extraordinarily intertwined um, forms of steel that ultimately define the, uh, the sculpture. Yeah, thank you. There's a whole, obviously there's a whole, there's so much of this project, but I did spend a long time drawing as I was making the sculptures. Um, there's a series of watercolors, pencil drawings, looking very closely at the work that Bertoia did, how he drew, how he composed. Um, and so I was both drawing and making the sculptures at the same time because part of it was unpredictable. I knew where I wanted to go, but also the, the steel and the, and, and of course I'm working with, with uh, machinery operators who are far away and I'm trying to move my arms to tell them how to twist the metal. So there was a, uh, it was like live action sculpture and there was a degree of unpredictability, but at certain moments we would stop and I would make a drawing and then presented, you know, we'd have a kind of a huddle in a group meeting and this is where we're going. This is where the, where, where the sculpture is going. And so, um, I gifted most of those drawings to the workmen that, that, that worked on the project. I saved a couple, but then there was of course the whole process of, of making the drawings that are the prints themselves, which, um, always as somebody that comes from the world of architecture, the act of drawing is something that's very important. But every every draw every architectural drawing has a lot of text in it as well. So the line, the text is something that is always and the three dimensional dimension is something that has always concerned me. Um, so that was part of the process. Um, David, during your research and write during your research and writing for U.S. embassies of the Cold War, the book that's in front of us, what became perhaps one of your favorite embassies and why? Well, they're a little like your children. They're all your favorite, I guess. Uh, I would think the, the embassy in Havana, who I had the fortune to go visit a couple of years ago, uh, because it was a pure international style, early 1950s, uh, not quite a curtain wall. So curtain wall is, you know, the glass hangs off the building. The UN was one of the first. I think Lieberhaus was not one of the soon after that. But essentially a curtain wall but very much a statement about the progress and creativity of America. Uh, no coincidence that, you know, the Bauhaus, which really developed the international style, was closed down by the Nazis, so there's a little nuance there. It sits on a very prominent site on the Malcon. Uh, unfortunately, it had one of the early uh, air conditioning systems ever built in a government building, and uh, it didn't work too well. There was too much sun on that corner. And then the travertine marble that came from Italy 
as part of the war debts uh, repayment uh, just wasn't well suited to the climate in uh, Cuba. So most of the exteriors had to be replaced. Uh, but it's had so much political intrigue. I mentioned a, f a few of the issues uh, in the past. Uh, but when Bush was President Bush Jr., uh, he actually uh, he put up neon signs uh, on the top two floors because nobody was there, nobody was really working, uh, that were quotes from Abraham Lincoln and uh, Martin Luther King, kind of provocative uh, quotes about the freedom of the freedom of America. And uh, well, the, the Cubans didn't like that very much. Uh, so they put up, it was called the Imperialist Plaza, and they put up black flags uh, on the other side of the building so that people driving by couldn't see uh, the building. So as, as many of you may know, uh, uh, embassies are, are sovereign land. They are basically, they're treated as though it's land in America. So you're not allowed to go in them. Even a fire department of a local uh, area is not allowed to go in unless they're authorized to do so. Uh, so anyway, there's a lot of political intrigue. I hope that that embassy continues to remain there. Uh, I didn't show it, but if you were to pull up on your uh, iPhones or whatever you have, uh, the U.S. embassy, the U.S. Embassy, the Russian embassy in Cuba, uh, it's about <laughs> just look it up. Anyway, it's it's. <laughs> It's quite different than our embassy, and it speaks volumes about what we did versus what the communists did. Thank you. Um, Jen, how does FAPE try to make its gifts accessible to the public? Um, well, as David noted, we're obviously they're very secure, but for the site-specific commission in particular, we try to place them in the most highly visible locations. Um, so that people from outside can see in. And this is actually um, lends to uh, Jorge Svent's idea. And we've been working very closely with the State Department. So these site-specific works um, that we're putting in, ensuring that there is a see-through fence. And if it is a concrete perimeter, perimeter, that there are windows so people can look in. And so for Joel Shapiro's piece in Guangzhou, China, that has been highly successful. Um, and then in Beijing, when we were installing Martin Purrier's piece, it is a concrete perimeter, but we did build in windows so that you can look in. And then Martin was also, um, he wanted the piece to soar. So his sculpture is 31 feet high. So it soars over the embassy wall, as well as you being able to look in. So we're very committed to making sure, because these are gifts from, you know, from Thabe, from the artists, from our, from our supporters, but they're for the people in that country. They get to know who we are as a nation. Sting, so perhaps one of you, all of you, might want to ask question. You want to start? Yeah, well, uh, I, we should have brought some slides, but so I showed the last slide in my presentation of Jeannie Gang's uh, uh, embassy that's, I think, supposed to be finished this year, maybe early next year, uh, in Brasilia. Uh, very attractive modernist building. I think, in my opinion, Jeannie Gang's one of the great architects in America right now. Uh, but the question is, can you build embassies that are both accessible and open, but also safe and protected? Is that are those mutually exclusive, or is that pot? Because you you see more embassies than anybody in, in this room. Uh, as I mentioned before, we went through a period where they were. They, they were called standard embassy design, and you, you really could only, when they were building the new embassies in the 90s and 2000s, it was uh, small, medium, and large, and they were boxes. That's all they were. So now we've moved almost back to where we were in the 1950s, but the question is, can you, because you have setbacks, because you have, it's called fenestration, you have a certain amount of windows that you can have accessible. Or, so how, how, is, how are we going to do that? Well, the state department is... Uh... It's been great to see that they're making more of a concerted effort to bring the public in. And for several projects that we're working on, um, one in particular in Hanoi, Vietnam, is that parallel to the consular entrance, there is going to be an American center so that people can come in and it's going to have a library. It's going to have a media room. And so it's very important to bring those spaces back. And the State Department is committed to it. So... Now, will it still be 
extraordinarily difficult to get in, probably, but at least they're going to have that space so it is accessible so you can get in. Well, I, I'm just so impressed by the by the work that I've been doing in terms of um, raising awareness about uh, U.S. embassies and the role of contemporary art in embassies. And I was just, you know, the, the book is here. I'm not sure that everybody can see David's book, which is such an important contribution. To Do I hear a first bid? The first bid? Five, five, six, and one of the things that I find amazing is that, you know, for most Americans, an embassy is just a place that they'll never set foot in. Um, but but for immigrants, um, they're... They're essential because they're the first place you go to. They're the first place of contact with the, as you said, they're sovereign. You know, your the, the the electricity plugs are different when you get to a U.S. embassy. You know, you know, you're in U.S. territory, and so um, there is a, a a great a discussion to be had about that that immigrant story today. We talk a lot about Ellis Island uh, and the way that people in the 19th century immigrated to America. But I was curious to hear from uh, David, from, from you and, and maybe Jen, I, I know a little bit less about your family history, but you know where those immigrant stories connect with these embassies for you? And why did you embassy in the cover of your book? Well, I, I, I did it because I'm Greek background partially. Uh, but I also did it because, as I mentioned before, uh, to choose Walter Gropius to build an embassy in the center of uh, Western democracy is, I don't think that was an accident. And so it's exciting to know about that. Uh, and the fact that uh, my grandparents on one side came to this country and uh, when I put it in the end of my book, I think, but uh, they were married for 60 some years, something like that. And, uh, on their an wedding anniversary, they sang their favorite song, which was God bless America. So, uh, and there was a, a an era of, it's kind of, a, a, Tom Brokaw wrote a book about it called the greatest generation, of a lot of sacrifice and, uh, uh, not, no, not bragging about serving in the war and serving this country and being patriotic. And, and it was a time when we, uh, Fought two wars and won both of them, and some could argue that we saved the world. So it was an important period. I think for me, um, working on so many projects at our embassies is seeing the other side of it and the people from those countries trying to come to America and what America means to them. And to legitimately trying to get into our nation is extraordinarily diffi difficult to get a visa. And there was one man um, who was our driver when we were in Kingston, Jamaica, and he had not seen his family in 15 years. And he had just gone through the visa process and he was denied again. And he can't reapply for another three years. And it's heartbreaking to hear this. But he keeps trying. But it's just it's amazing to, to hear these people and wanting to come to America for what it stands for. Um, but then also so many family that they don't get to see. But I have a question for these two. Of all the Cold War embassies, who's your favorite architect? Saarinen. Is that okay? <laughs> I think Saarinen was extraordinary as an architect. He practiced, obviously he worked with his father, but um, he completed, I think it's 32 buildings in 13 years. And he died prematurely of a brain tumor. Um, just extraordinarily prolific, and you can just see him thinking out loud in each of these projects. And um, there is a CBS Tower, Black Rock over here, was designed at the same time as the U.S. Embassy in Norway, same stone. Um, and you can see him iterating in each project. He just was such a creative mind and such a collaborator. He, he, has, he just was surrounded with... Um, incredible people, and he was deeply committed to art. I don't think he saw the difference between art and architecture so much. And those exchanges, those dialogues he had with Bertoya, for me, are uh, really, really um, great lessons, you know, for how to... Oh, talk a minute about the uh, the eagle on the 
the former U.S. Embassy, how controversial that was, and because that was in London. In London, yeah. Uh, you should you should talk about. That. Well, I don't know if it's. We can't go back to the picture, but uh, back to the go back to the embassy. And I forgot the dimensions, but I think it was roughly sixty feet by something like that, and this big looming eagle over the embassy. Uh, Theodore Rosick, I can't remember. Anyway, something like that. Uh, but it was widely criticized uh, for being too aggressive and too kind of offensive, not defensive, but kind of offensive because it was uh, eagle wings. Yeah, if you go back, uh, I, I go back. Just keep flipping back. Yeah. That good, that's a damn good It was good also looking the wrong way. It was looking towards... One more? Towards the... Yeah, keep going. One more. A few more. Sorry, everybody. That's the Batoya. Yeah. There you go. See the eagle on the front? Uh, and it was, a, uh, I believe, the former U.S. Embassy before this was built. I think uh, uh, Saren had barely made it because the, actually, the, the, I, sh I should have said the dates on, on these are the de design dates, not the uh, opening dates, because the embassies often took many years to get built. In fact, the uh, U.S. Embassy in uh, Dublin that uh, John Johansson built almost didn't get built, but took six years to get built. And JFK had to step in and, and uh, intervene to make sure it happened. And it happened, actually opened, I think it's 1962 uh, on St. Patrick's Day. But anyway, I like, Sarah's great because that's just a, it's great. Did the State Department take it off the building before they gave it to the, well, they, to the they, categories? Well, they, unfortunately, they, they uh, I don't want to get into it because I'll get criticized for it, but uh <laughs> Uh, they put a, another floor on this building with windows that are significantly larger than the, the existing windows. Uh, I was telling somebody the other day, uh, it's a little embarrassing, but I went to London uh, three or four years ago, and um, three years ago, whatever, and uh, staying nearby Gro Grosvenor Square and was anxious to see what they were doing after it had been decommissioned and this hotel or whatever. And I walked around the corner, Grosvenor Square, and all it was is three walls. Everything had been gutted, and I literally, because I spent a lot of years writing that book and doing my thesis with Jorge, uh, I had tears running out my eyes, and I had a doorman in one of the buildings uh, facing Grosvenor Square who came out and put his arm around me, and he said, are you okay? And I said, I'm an American, and I just, this kills me to see this, and he said, I know, I agree. So I don't, I, I don't, I don't think it's on the, I don't know, actually. I should know. I don't remember. They, they considered a grade two building, so it's not, not the highest, and they only protect walls. Sadly, uh, it was a Qatari development firm that, that, that gutted it, put it into a, rethemed it as a British hunting lodge. If, but this, this was a good example of what could have been. I mean, it was sold for a lot of money, but given the annual budget in America, I'm doing that drop in the bucket, but this would have been a great American center. It's probably one of the great sites in London. Oh. It was called Little America. That's right. That's right. That's just, his house yeah. is still there. Would anyone like to ask a question? Yes. Um, just going. Yeah. Uh, my question is: of the embassies, were any of them completely demolished? And like, what's the percentage of those that were demolished? If there was a number of them. Yeah, we should go to the one towards the end. That was good. Back, back to it. Yeah. One more. Two more. Whoop. Uh, three or four of those uh, have been demolished. Most of um, Baghdad was abandoned. Uh, it's sitting there. Uh, what else has been sold? As I said, Mexico City's in the process of being decommissioned, but that's, I don't know what's, maybe Jenny, I don't know what's going to happen to that building. Uh, uh, Dublin is a landmark building, so I assume that's not going to go away. Uh, Ghana was, uh, I think, bought by the, the government for a dollar. It's now a children's center, but uh, 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 a few of those, yeah, there are a few have been torn down, but most, most have uh, either been sold or Manila was significantly altered. Um, 
Rio, a great building. That's another Harrison and Bromwich. That's still there. That's now a consulate. Uh, as many of you may know, embassies are in major capitals. Consulates are in significant cities. The two, uh, Rapson and, and Van der Meulen, those are beautiful uh, international style. Those are still around. So they're doing okay. But, you know, to gut London and leave three facades, uh, they might as well have torn it down. Wondering why so many of the uh, Cold War uh, embassies were decommissioned. What? Why they were decommissioned. So the, when they were originally built uh, between 1948 and 1962, it was a very different time. Uh, the, the single biggest threat to America was eavesdropping and uh, espionage. But it wasn't car-delivered bombs. It wasn't terrorists. that just didn't exist in those days. There was a story about when the London Embassy opened in the early 1960s uh, that the only security officer there was an 80-year-old guy with a cane. Uh, as I mentioned, so there was a Beirut bombing in 83 and then Kenya and Tanzania in 98. Uh, and so the world changed. And when these buildings were built, they were built in uh, urban, dense urban environments. And so where you see London is, is a good example. That was a pretty much a residential neighborhood. Uh, and they had to close the, close the streets off and have bollards. And it was a, it was a Band-Aid. And uh, the Inman report that came out, it was 85, I guess, uh, said that these buildings just can't be adequately protected. They're just, you can't do it because you have too many buildings around it. You have, it's too dense an environment. So what did they do? The the new embassy in London in Nine Elms, it's not my favorite, but it's fine, uh, is, I think it's what, eight or nine acres? It has a moat around it. Uh, so that what they moved to was a very big campus kind of environment. And one of the reasons that Athens and New Delhi remain, aside from being great, buildings and uh, built by Gregor architects and their landmark is they have a, a large uh, plot. They have a large site, many, you know, 10 to 20 acres. So you can do things with that kind of site. But when you've got a building like London, which faces a park and a street, makes it difficult. So, Yes, our time has come to end. Thank you all for your interest in this multi-layered subject. Likewise, I want to thank panelists for sharing their expertise so that we may have learned more about contemporary art or embassies. I personally want to give a shout out to Lawrence, director of the Jorge Otilo Studio, in one way or another, as assist each of us is here today. Enjoy the treasures in the galleries. Thank you.